for most of us because they worked together in City Hall when the Minister was working under Boris Johnson as Mayor. And I'm going to assume that, Minister, you're going to say that Dame Cressida should say, so stay. So let's bring this a different way. Why? Why is she fit for the purpose in the light of the Sir Everard case? Good morning, Minister. Good morning, Nick. And look, I, I should start by saying I totally understand the, the concern about this case and its devastating implications uh, for the Metropolitan Police. It's been a, a dreadful episode. For somebody like me who's spent uh, the last more than a decade now working closely with the police, uh, it's it's really shaming um, that this man used the cover of being a police officer to perpetrate this awful crime. Look, on your, on your primary question, I think two things. First of all, it's worth remembering that being Metropolitan Police Commissioner um, is, I think, in the top three most difficult jobs in the country. You're handling enormous risk in very difficult circumstances, uh, asking your officers to do challenging and confrontational things on a daily basis. Um, what I want out of a policing leader when these kind of devastating things happen is a transparency, non-defensiveness, a willing to change, willingness to change, and a willingness to embrace the problem and own it and deal with it. And that's what I see with Cressida Dick. And as you, you said in your preamble, I've worked with her over the last uh, 10 years or so, and she's a dedicated and committed uh, yes. detective and police constable. And I think um, she, she is dedicating herself. So you can be transparent, her. willing to change, but incompetent. Well, I'm not sure that's necessarily fair, oh, Nick. I mean, obviously... Kit Malthouse, come on. How far back do you want to go? Operation Midland, the Police Extinction Rebellion, the investigation into Daniel Morgan saying that the force is institutionally corrupt, a police officer nicknamed the rapist, two possible allegations of flashing at a hamburger bar and nothing done. What more do I have to say, Mr Malthouse? Well, Nick, obviously there are, you're quite right, there are significant lessons that we will need to learn about this, about what what went wrong, how this man managed to become a police officer, despite these allegations being made against him, and whether and if those allegations were made against him. And there are inquiries ongoing about that. We're also, as you will know, uh, the uh, inspectorate is having a good look, forensic look at the Met's vetting procedures to make sure that they are doing everything they're supposed to be doing, and that is as tight as possible. Um, and as you know, Nick, uh, Will, from the past, I'm not shy about commenting on the performance of, of commissioners and uh, previous commissioners obviously were moved on uh, because of that. But my view is that given the fight against crime and the conviction and commitment that Cresta is showing to improvement in the, the Metropolitan Police, she's the right person for the job. OK. You might not know the actual numbers, but there's a disturbing report in the I newspaper today, Minister. A total of 771 officers and staff within the Metropolitan Police have faced sexual misconduct allegations in the last 11 years, just 83 of whom were fired. Is there an epidemic of this in the Met? Well, I'll have to have a look at the numbers that, that have, you're right in the media this morning, Nick, but I don't think so, no. I mean, obviously those are allegations. Well, what do you call 771 cases then, Minister? Well, those are allegations, Nick, and, and police officers, like everybody, have a, a right to rely on, on due process and whether allegations are proven or not. What we have to make sure is that both internally in the Met and externally, independently, there is a robust police investigation uh, system that can get to the bottom of these matters and dismiss or otherwise discipline those officers who require it for whatever the allegation may be. But as you know, uh, Nick, given the nature of the job of policing, particularly out there on the front line, uh, often complaints come thick and fast from confrontational and difficult situations. Um, we need to make sure that the public have confidence they're being taken seriously and appropriate action is being taken. But at the same time, that those constables out there, the thousands of them every day doing brilliant stuff, that they know they can rely on a proportionate and fair complaint system. Well, that's interesting you talk about the public because, to my knowledge, you have at least one daughter. What would your advice be to anybody, but particularly women, as to if they are stopped by police officers who are in uniform, who present a warrant card but are operating alone, what is the government advice as to how they can be, ensure their security? So you've put your finger on the button, Nick. I mean, this is the, the as a both a father, but a husband and a, a brother and son. Um, th this is the really devastating implication that a question mark is raised over a police officer in those circumstances. Um, what the Metropolitan Police have said is that uh, obviously officers are deployed uh, uh, not that often singly in plain clothes, albeit, as you know, the police officers take a... a, a 
an oath that even if they're off duty, they'll intervene. So they may be in plain clothes for that reason. But if anybody has any doubt about the conduct of a police officer, that they can ask reasonable questions of that police officer, they should, if, if they want to, seek verification by asking to speak to the control room on the officer's radio or on their phone or in extreme circumstances. If they are very worried, they can call 999 and ask for verification. In most circumstances where a police officer, well, in almost all circumstances, all circumstances where a police officer is effecting an arrest, they should be reporting that in and calling for backup. Um, and so there should be connection with a third party, which will enable someone to verify their their, their wherewithal. Does this mean the end, do you imagine, for plain clothes solo policing loan patrols? Well, as I say, solo policing loan patrols in plain clothes is extremely rare. Um, uh, obviously not least because from an officer's safety point of view um, officers don't deploy in those circumstances singly uh, but I do recognise that, that from time to time it is possible and in those circumstances given this question mark this devastating awful event it is perfectly reasonable for somebody to seek verification about an officer's bona fides. Okay. Um, nothing, of course, touches the gravity of this horrific case. But while I have the benefit on the line, we do have to touch another policing matter, which is the issues on the M25. It also has to be said outside uh, the, the port at Dover in Kent. Injunctions sought by the government clearly having no effect. You are, to remind all my listeners, you are Crime and Policing Minister. Uh, this is soft touch policing. We need to see more robust action, don't we, Minister? Well, I think two things. First of all, there's what the police can do. Um, and we're definitely seeing more robust action uh, than we were right at the start. Uh, most of these protests are being cleared quite quickly. Uh, obviously, they make that difficult by by gluing themselves to the carriageway. But even in those circumstances, we're getting quite smart about moving them fast, um, which is hopefully minimising the disruption. But don't we need to nick them? In some instances, they, well, they're there at seven in the morning in Kent and they're back at one o'clock lunchtime, Minister. Well, we, we do and we are. And they're obviously being charged with offences. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, Nick, the fences that we can charge them with at the moment mean that we can, even if we charge them immediately, we have to bail them and release them. And at the moment, such is their um, uh, determination, know, such is their determination or whatever it might be, madness, that they are, are going back and repeating uh, the offence. But, but why don't we make it a condition again. of bail? They can't return to within a mile of the M25 unless they're moving or whatever it might be. I'm sure there's language that can be found. Well, we do, but they are obviously breaching those bail conditions as well, Nick. Uh, so we're we're looking at the offence mix and we're talking to the police about what they can be charged with. But even whatever the charge might be, our ability to hold them indefinitely is obviously limited pending a, a trial. On the injunction uh, issue, uh, obviously that is a, a civil matter, effectively, uh, but it is very serious, a breach of an injunction, repeated uh, breach. Uh, as I understand it, those injunctions have now been served on those individuals, um, and they are now in contempt of court, and it may be that the national highways, who obviously own the road, will apply to a judge for, for committal hearing to present them in front of a judge when they could get up to two years in prison and an unlimited fine. So we're working our way through the process at the moment, uh, Nick. But, but as you you're working right. through, a lot of people can't get to a day's work, you're aware right. of that, and they're not, they're not earning in some cases, Minister. Many of these blokes and women are, are paid per job or whatever, they're not making any cash. Minister, I, I look. I, I completely understand. I totally do, and I get people's frustration. And and I just wish those protesters understood as well. Um, but obviously, the police have to operate within the law, as you will know, Nick. We've got the police crime courts and sentencing bill going through, right. which does give the police more power to deal with uh, people in these circumstances. Um, at the moment, we're we're looking at what more we can do to be adventurous. Uh, with uh, with injunctions. Uh, but in the meantime, I would just appeal to those protesters to recognise the misery and the difficulty and the danger that they're causing to other road users and desist from this action. Right. We've got the point, right? They can give up and go home now. Uh, and lastly, a, a lot of people aren't able to go home because they're stuck in lines, queues, trying to get petrol or diesel. Um, a week on, we still hear the government saying the army might be deployed. What is the current situation? And You don't subscribe to this theory that the situation is easing, do you, Minister? Because it's not in London. Well, I think it's it's stabilising, Nick, I think is what, the, uh, is what is becoming clear, that we are seeing an increase in supply and a, a reduction in demand, which means that things are stabilising. But still, people are naturally anxious about the, the important journeys that they have to make and their ability to go about their daily lives and indeed work um, and make deliveries. And so we are seeing uh, different patterns of demand and strong demand in different parts of the country. We're looking at it very closely. We're working with the industry, as you know, uh, to try and make sure that we can get supply out there. There's no problem with supply into the country. It's a distribution. So whose fault is this, Kit? 
Well, I, I don't. Does it have to be somebody's fault? Yeah, it does. There are people. There are people queuing for two and a half hours to get petrol. I would suggest something has gone wrong. If something's gone wrong, normally someone is to blame. I repeat my question, Kit Malthouse. Whose fault is it? Well, I think it's it's uh, there are complicated. If it's the media, if it's me, say it, I'm big enough and broad enough to take it on the chin. If you think it's the media, I, I want to know who you think it might be. Well, there are complicated reasons about the stimulation of demand in an, uh, a period in which people are anxious against difficulties of, of supply. Now, the difficulties of those two coming together can exacerbate a situation. We saw it in the past, Nick, on, on toilet roll. Uh, during, the, if you remember, at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, which was unnecessary. Itself, so it is it unnecessary, unnecessary panic right? buying, effectively. So there, is, there is no supply problem coming into the country. If we can uh, get demand stabilised, then supply can resume, and hopefully over the next few days um, and a couple of weeks, we'll get back to some kind of normality. All right, grateful for your time. We've gone over time. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Conservative MP and Crime and Policing Minister Kit Malthouse, appearing here on LBC. We're at one minute after it. Let's catch up with the latest LBC headline, Simon Conway. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, the Metropolitan Police is investigating whether the officer who murdered Sarah Everard committed more